All right, welcome everyone. I would like to get started because we have quite a bit to cover. So um, hello and welcome to our webinar, Humanitarian Data Insights and Opportunities for Generative AI, co-hosted by Datakind and Save the Children with the support of Microsoft AI for Humanitarian Action. Thank you very much for being here. And thanks also to uh, those of you who are making the time to watch the recording of this webinar. I'd like to start with an introduction to our speakers today. In a few moments, uh, John Zoltner will be kicking things off. Uh, John is lead for technology for development and innovation at Save the Children, focusing on initiatives that improves program results, increases their reach and amplifies their impact in protecting children from online harm. Matthew Harris is the head of data science at Datakind. Matt oversees product development across the organization and is the solutions lead on this project that we're presenting today and also heads up our data science and AI strategy. I'm Itali, Tali for short, uh, and I lead Datakind's health and humanitarian portfolio. Leading our community programs is Rachel Wells, who ensures that Datakind's projects are executed with a diverse group of users and focuses on capacity building to enable social impact organizations leverage data science and AI. So here's what we'll cover today. We'll start with some context and just give you a brief background on how this project came to be. We'll then share the results of the first phase of user research, which actually highlighted uh, some of the key pain points in working with humanitarian data. Matt will then uh, present the opportunities for leveraging generative AI to address these pain points and the solutions that we're developing, hopefully with your help. Uh, we, you know, we deeply value the work that you all do, and so we'd actually like to take a few minutes to touch on our approach to building in safety and ensuring ethical uses of these new tools and techniques. And one of our central tenets is to design with not for. So your participation and guidance is vital to co-creating these tools, and that's what Rachel is going to talk about, and she'll dive into the various ways in which we hope you will get involved. And we'll close out, of course, with Q&A, and we'll save plenty of time for that. In case you're wondering about who Datakind is, uh, we are a global nonprofit, and we work to harness the power of data science and AI in service of humanity. Uh, we, are, um, we exist mainly to improve the uh, capabilities reach and scale of social impact organizations and local leaders to tackle some of their toughest challenges with data science and create positive social change. We're based in the US with chapters in uh, San Francisco, in Washington DC. We're also uh, based in London, UK, in Bengaluru, in India and in Singapore. And we have a vibrant network of more than 30,000 supporters around the world. We do what we do because we know that social impact organizations are working on some of the most wicked problems facing humanity. And these intractable challenges consistently need us to explore how technology can enable more evidence-based, coordinated and timely decision-making and action. We consider one of our chief responsibilities that of de-risking the space, the exploration, as well as the adoption of data science and AI and ensuring that social actors have access to the best technologies to better serve their communities and tackle urgent issues. In terms of how we approach solution building, we really strive to ensure our solutions are accessible, which means we try to make sure that these are open source where possible and offer the best in class documentation and training opportunities for end users. We also aim for flexibility, allowing users to define and customize solutions to their contexts. And we try to ensure that our solutions are reusable to support transferability between locations and contexts. With that, I'd now like to invite uh, John to share a few opening remarks. Over to you, John. Thanks, Tali. Uh, you can go to the first slide. So. I joined Save the Children about five years ago because of this tremendous reach. You can see uh, 
We, through our humanitarian work, we reach more than 26 million people a year, and uh, we reach over 183 million children overall last year. Uh, so we're really a, a scale machine. Uh, we're able to work in about 120 countries across the world right now. And uh, we work in both the global now, north and the global south, but with a focus on the global south, especially Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And we're often the first or the only child-focused organization working in, in the hardest uh, to reach places where it's toughest to be a child. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, we've So we were founded more than a hundred years ago. So we've had to constantly innovate in order to be able to, to reach the still, children uh, who need our help. Um, and we, we do that in many ways, but a couple of examples here are, we were a co-founder with World Visions for the Response Innovation Lab. Uh, and, and those are labs or centers we create in various countries in order to surface innovations that are happening in the country um, or, or take suggestions from, from people we're working with or organizations or community groups we're working with in, in countries where we're based. Uh, in order to help them take ideas that they have for for uh, the best ways to do development or respond to humanitarian emergencies and help them uh, proof test the ideas and, and scale those ideas up if uh, it looks like they're promising. Uh, we also, we launched a humanitarian leadership academy um, which is a, a place to go for training and many different issues related to humanitarian work. Uh, we were one of eight organizations that founded the Global Emergency Response Coalition more than 10 years ago that helps us coordinate our action. And today we'll be talking about a, a, a way we can better coordinate actions by sharing data or, or accessing more data. And uh, we, we also do things like partner with gamers or, or work with gaming companies in order to uh, use the information that they have in order to reach hundreds of millions of children uh, so that we can do things like use artificial intelligence to understand their behavior online so that we're able to respond to that behavior with them. Um, for instance, offer, offers of uh, psychosocial services in the real world. Uh, so the reason I got involved with Datakind on this project is uh, we had identified with several partners that uh, the problem we faced with um, when we reacted to a humanitarian emergency is that um, we're in such emergency mode that we need to immediately go out to the zone wherever, uh, let's say an earthquake happens in Haiti. And uh, so Save the Children and many of our peers like Oxfam or Mercy Corps or CRS uh, also go out. But uh, the challenge we all have is it's difficult, it's difficult enough within our organizations to, to access all the data that we have and be able to combine that with uh, open data that may exist in the countries that, that we're responding in, uh, it's, it's really hard to almost impossible to share that data among many organizations. So what happens is there are always a risk that we'll go into the same area and do the same thing, or um, we'll, we'll uh, well, we won't coordinate sufficiently our operations uh, so that we're not able to react uh, as quickly or in um, make database decisions as we would if we were better able to share information. Uh, so we came to Datakind almost two years ago now uh, for help with that issue. 
Uh, we've been working together uh, first on an informal basis with Data Kinds volunteers and, and uh, the data deep dives that they've run in order to help us explore the issue. Uh, and recently, we Microsoft came into the mix and is helping us uh, on a more technical level. Uh, and with their tremendous reach and, and deep bench to help us uh, envision how we can better use generative AI uh, in order to, uh, to, to access data and analyze data uh, so that we can make those database decisions. Um, thank you, John, for for that uh, for your opening remarks. And I think that's a perfect moment to go a little bit into this project specifically uh, and what we're doing here. And if I could just take a step back uh, from what you were saying, John, uh, around. Uh, the, the challenges that you face when it comes to actual coordination and why why that is now such a critical issue. Um, I think most of you, if not all of you uh, who are here and, and are watching this webinar uh, are no doubt aware that the humanitarian community is facing unprecedented uh, strain amid escalating crises amplified by climate change and global conflicts. The UN humanitarian ask last year broke new records a $41 billion request to help 183 million people in need across 63 countries. The rising costs of aid driven by war, economic shocks, and the climate emergency means that funding commitments are just not able to keep pace with the demand. And so we are really forced to think about how we deliver humanitarian action. I know every Humanitarian organization is, is thinking about their position, their role um, in, in how we go forward. And part of it is how can we employ all available tools and technology to enable more effective and impactful humanitarian response. The, one, of the, one of the opportunities or this, you know, the, what we really need is making evidence-based decisions around prioritization. It has become more important than ever. Uh, we need accurate and timely data, which is critical to planning and executing an effective and efficient response, especially around the evolving needs of affected populations. And of course, humanitarian organizations and people working within them need to maximize the use of available data and need to explore how technology can enable more evidence-based, coordinated and timely action. Basically uh, saying what, what John uh, just introduced as well from the perspective of when uh, several actors go in into the same location and there's a lot of duplication of efforts. When it comes to maximizing the use and the value and the access to data, it seems that this is where generative AI is offering some profound and transformative opportunities. Gen AI tools are seen as easy to consume, customize, and able to really augment human capacities. So to deep dive into this, Data Kind and Save the Children with Microsoft AI for Humanitarian Action is exploring, designing, and going into developing generative AI solutions that address some of the highest priority data challenges and improve the humanitarian um, sector's ability to respond efficiently and effectively. We're calling this the Humanitarian Data Insights Project, and the objective uh, is to build independent, self-contained generative AI tools that perform specific functions to address those persistent and pervasive data pain points. The solutions will focus on allowing for flexibility, scalability, and adaptability and will be designed with safety as a top priority. The goal is really to ensure that any platform, organizations, any actor really within the ecosystem can leverage these solutions to prioritize action and make timely decisions. We believe that this will increase the speed, scope, and impact of humanitarian response. We started this project about six months ago, and since then we've mainly focused on user research. 
So building on the work that Data Kind and Save the Children started, the path we started on about two years ago, but really focusing now on a much wider um, systematic user research, as well as a lot of practical research into generative AI as well. And over the next 12 months, we're going to be focusing on co-developing these solutions with users, as well as using key opportunities to share what we're learning as we go along. So what did we learn from user research? I'm gonna dive in a little bit about that before I hand over to uh, the, the generative AI research and findings. We were really looking to learn about specific challenges that people at humanitarian organizations face when working with data and develop a robust taxonomy of those pain points. The idea of categorizing them so that we could really identify high impact areas where new tools or solutions are most needed and will be most impactful. We uh, use multiple mechanisms to better understand what these high priority pain points are. And uh, we reached out directly to the humanitarian community. So we conducted uh, the usual structured, semi-structured user interviews we had um, you know, with, with key individuals from, from humanitarian organizations, but we also spoke to data services providers and platform partners as well. We also sent out surveys to gain insights into how various individuals or teams function and functions experience data and data-related pain points. Many of you who, who have been a part of this process are here right now, so just want to say a big thank you to uh, to helping us and participating in this user research. We also conducted desk research and an in-depth literature review in you know, the old school way. We just spent a couple of months uh, just deep diving into the literature that was out there about um, you know, challenges with, with coordination and specifically data related challenges. But we also introduced an AI augmented literature research where we used GPT-4 to conduct the search, review, and synthesis across the Relief Web platform. There was a lot there, and we'll, we'll probably not touch on that too much right now, but happy to uh, tell you more about that uh, as well. Just to give you a few examples of um, the challenges that people described, I think one of the most widely cited issues um, in our interviews and from our surveys was around being able to combine different bits of information to create a better, fuller picture of what was going on and actually specifically identify the needs so that organizations could coordinate a more efficient response. Uh, related to that was really getting the data over to teams in the field in a way that would integrate better with the way they already do their work. We categorized these uh, types of pain points as data harmonization, which is the lack of an ability to quickly and accurately combine key data at the right geographic location and at the right scale. Uh, another uh, major issue that came up across uh, our conversations repeatedly, um, as well as in the literature, was really around finding the right data at the right time and by the right person. Often people who aren't uh, who you'd call data professionals, but are leading a response or coordinating the response, um, aren't able to directly explore the data and determine for themselves what is the right data to use. There's also the consideration that people, communities who we're actually trying to reach and, and help are often subjected to repeated assessments. And there was a, um, a strong, uh, let's say theme, if you like, running in our conversations with um, individuals, that there's got to be a better way to navigate the data that already exists uh, without needing to repeat assessments and subjecting people to assessments. We categorize these pain points around data discovery, the impacts of which can lead to, of course, inefficiencies and in coordination, but also more serious problems, like when data sharing sort of becomes, happens in an uncontrolled way and without clear safety and ethical protocols. So we, we had a lot more. Uh, we, we had several, um, lots and lots of different examples of pain points, which we were able to synthesize and uh, create the following categories um, for classifying these pain points. Um, the, there are 
you'll see commonalities between the issues within the same category, which provides some insight into the root causes of these pain points. Um, however, not all of the pain points were of equal importance, if you like, in, in when, we, when we actually spoke to folks and when we did our literature review. And based on the frequency um, of how often these pain points were shared or came up in conversations, we were able to create a prioritization. This has helped us focus on some of the most critical issues uh, when designing solutions. So with that, I actually would like to now hand over to Matt, who'll take us through how he mapped those pain points onto possible generative AI solutions. Over to you, Matt. Thanks a lot, Tali. Um, so based on that user research and the real, um, real world um, requirements of the community, and thank you again so much for all that information that was provided, um, we embarked on a, a pretty comprehensive landscape review of the technology and all of the supporting technology that's required for bringing to bear the power of generative AI. Um, but one aspect of that that um, we realized quite early on, there's quite understandably a significant amount of concern with the use of generative AI, um, mainly around um, the aspect where um, it can hallucinate and be very plausible and present information that's factually incorrect, as well as issues with equity, bias, and so forth. So we decided to um, analyze the continuum of types of solutions. And what we um, see from this is that um, they range from, from high to low risk. And so we determine not to focus on high risk, ap high risk applications. So for example, chatbots that are answering questions based on the large language model um, on, on its training data. Um, these are very risky and um, require a, a much more involved process to ensure that they're safe and can be applied in the humanitarian context. Um, so instead, and, it, and, and luckily this aligned really well with the community and their feedback and your feedback is that um, there are solutions where we want to leverage the language power of large language models. They are incredible at, at um, understanding uh, the, the questions uh, that you may ask. And then they are very, very powerful for analyzing the structure of data that we provide to provide answers um, back to um, humanitarians. Uh, and as such, there's it, we mitigate some of the risk that applies to many Gen, gen AI applications. If we can ground it to only provide feedback based on the data that we have provided, that we provide nothing else, then we reduce drastically the the um, potential for things like hallucination and and bias and issues with equity, etc. Um, similarly. Um, if we choose very technical solutions that again are, are able to leverage that amazing power of large language models for processing text and structure, um, we hope to mitigate some of the concerns that, that are very valid in the field with the use of generative AI. So with that in mind, and based on the taxonomy and the feedback, we resolved on a set of four key areas um, where we believe there are opportunities with generative AI. Of course, this isn't exhaustive, and there are many others which, which may not be listed here, but we've we we basically chose to we chose these four key areas as they kept coming up time and time again with different users and in the and in the literature. Um, and one interesting aspect of this, as you can see from this um, this diagram, is that the taxonomy to the prospective solutions in generative AI, it isn't a one-to-one -one mapping. So for example, um, uh, taking that second point, metadata prediction, some of you may be familiar um, with the, H the amazing HDX platform, which has a, a metadata standard called HXL. And it goes down to the column level on tables, which is very, very useful for combining data sets together. Um, and so that has implications on um, conversational data analysis, and it has implications for, uh, to address a wide range of pain points. So it's just to illustrate that the, the, the situation is a, is a sort of many-to-many -many, um, relationship here. Um, we opted to focus on two key areas, conversational data analysis, um, uh, which I'll expand on a little bit in a while, as well as this, this concept of metadata prediction. And, um, 
around all of this is um, is absolutely key, of course, is a, is a solid validation and safety framework to ensure that any solutions we bring to bear are, 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 are safe uh, and, and um, uh, have clear and obvious validation frameworks around them. Uh, yep. So looking at, at conversational data analysis, I'm sure many of you will have um, already come into contact with this idea of being able to ask your data questions. And so many of the respondents were um, provided information along the lines of, well, there's all this amazing data, but there's so much of it. I can't make head nor tail of it. Which data sets are important? Uh, or, or maybe I'm, I'm not a data scientist. I want to help people. I want to bring to bear that amazing data, which I know exists, but I don't know how to surface insights so that I can actually use it to help my day-to-day -day work. Um, and so we we resolved that there is an opportunity here for providing people with a conversational way to ask questions of con complex data so that um, using natural language, as if you were asking a human being um, uh, particular sets of questions. Now, key to this, this particular use case is we are, we are really, really eager, as we'll come on to in a little while, um, it's really important to determine what are the use cases um, that are going to be most useful to the community. So we've already... Um, captured many of these from our initial round of feedback, but we hope to drill down further into this to find out what would be most useful day to day if you were able to ask an agent questions. So the second area is metadata prediction. Oh, sorry, <laughs> my apologies. So just to give you an, um, an example of how this might work, we've been we've been rapidly prototyping. We probably have about 30 or 40 prototypes in using different combinations of technology to fully understand the production infrastructure and rollout of generative AI techniques. And this is actually a prototype that we've developed, which is able to interact with ReliefWeb and HDX. It's very formative. So it's just to illustrate the kinds of things that um, we might be able to um, provide with a, a, a generative AI assistant for data. Um, so I've I've increased the text size on the questions, but just to give you an idea, you can ask it questions about current events um, and it's able to interact with the relief web um, data set to get the latest situation reports, um, as well as interact with HDX and, and get basic insights and, and hopefully more comprehensive insights as we get more feedback from, from you all about what would be most useful. Um, not only can it surface information, it can um, the prototype we've already developed can do basic data analysis. So, you know, um, as you can see here, plot me, plot me a graph of um, population by admin level two in a particular location. Um, but we've also got examples of combining data from different places and doing plots. So this is an alpha prototype, but it's just to illustrate the kind of the direction that we're hoping to take with a humanitarian assistant. So the second stream is metadata prediction. Um, and so it's somewhat technical and, and might not be, um, you know, it, it might seem um, a bit opaque, um, but basically the idea is you've got all this amazing, uh, wonderful data and we want to, uh, we want to combine, in many cases, the, there's a requirement to combine it. So we may have locations and their, um, the, the mapping data for those locations. Uh, we may need to determine where water sources are in a particular place. So maybe we need to combine those two data sets together. Um, uh, metadata is an incredibly important way to do that. It's an incredibly important way to bring together data sets from different systems. Um, and one of the things we've determined in, in doing our analysis is that large language models um, are very powerful at predicting metadata tags. Um, Prior to this, uh, to, to tag data with metadata fields, it requires that the person uploading the data goes through every column and puts a tag on it. There are some amazing tools on the HDX platform that really, really help with this, but other platforms may not have those tools. And so this is another um, area where the community has, has provided feedback. And they've provided feedback like, I, I want to combine data from this place and that place. I want to, I, there's too much data. I, I, I can't quite figure out which data is important. And that's where the metadata comes in to play. So we're also exploring this as a second avenue in our phase one um, uh, work. So 
it's not just about um, AI, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of hype flying around about how magic these things may or may not be. But actually, at the end of the day, we have to implement something in a production and safe environment that is uh, efficient, that um, can be used by any organization. Um, and so we're looking I, all of these nodes here have a set of technologies behind them, and we have already been exploring um, a, a rapid group of prototypes to determine what's the safest way for um, doing uh, DevOps. How, do, how can we automatically deploy this so that every time it runs through a, a rigorous safety framework and a set of automated tests, how can we monitor this in production? Um, how can we optimize cost? How can we make it fast? How can we give an agent memory so that it remembers you as a particular person, a particular question about a certain data set? So our, our analysis so far, our technical analysis has included all of these different areas that you see here. Cool. So next we'll come on to a section, as I alluded to briefly earlier, is, is around our validation framework and how we center this work on humanity. Now, we have a track record of working with humanitarian organizations, um, which, you know, using uh, data and AI ethically is absolutely core to, to what we believe. And I think I'm safe to say that it's, it's true to say for everybody on this call and most people on this call. Um, and so we aim to bring to bear best in class tools, but the caveat there is we don't want to use Gen AI just for the sake of using Gen AI. And all of our solutions are examples where Gen AI is best in class and outperforms other techniques in that particular use case. So I think it's quite, uh, quite important to um, stress that point. Um, and in the recent uh, Generative AI for Humanitarians from UNOCHA, which is a wonderful, wonderful report, around um, uh, the guardrails and safe, safe and ethical use of generative AI. Um, uh, we had some input into that and it's an, it's an amazing report. We are very, very aligned with that. And, and um, many of the aspects within that report uh, are good common sense um, groundings for how to apply generative AI. So, as I mentioned earlier, this framework is to sit on any um, solution that we have to ensure that it's safety, it's safe. So I mentioned earlier, and I'm sure many of you are aware, one of the main areas where um, uh, generative AI, specifically large language models can um, suffer and be somewhat risky is around hallucination and the pre presenting information that appears incredibly plausible, but isn't. Um, and so if you could go to the next slide, please. So this is the infrastructure um, that we are um, prototyping currently. It's, it's, it's formative and we look to the community to work uh, to refine and improve this. But fundamental to the architecture is the concept that um, we will have automated testing. We will, we will be testing prompts, variants of prompts, um, and that will be an integral part of us deploying any um, process and it's an automatic part. Um, this has already been configured and that set of tests will grow over time based on your feedback. Um, we have the concept of groundedness and uh, density emissions, uh, uh, information emission. What does that mean? So the assistant is going to be providing um, feedback and answering questions about data from various humanitarian data sources, such as HDX, Relief Web, um, and there are many more, of course. Um, we need to ensure that um, using the large language model to provide summaries of that information, it is grounded in fact, because even though we've mitigated the risk of hallucination um, to some degree, it's still possible in summarization. So we've developed a fact checker module um, that is uh, able to ground responses to ensure there's no, um, there are no hallucinations, as well as um, in, um, score the results for information density. With any summary, um, you do throw away some information. And so we wish to be transparent and clear about uh, the level of, that, of information density that the AI assistant will present to the user. Um, content safety filters. So um, we've already implemented this um, using some uh, really great solutions that already exist in the field to monitor every single interaction, input and output for uh, hate and fairness, sexual violence, language, 
related to self-harm, as well as technical um, issues like trying to um, what's called jailbreak and, and uh, get around all of the safety checks that we have um, within the solution, as well as protect for protect and um, protect for, for um, uh, intellectual infringement material that shouldn't be presented to the user. And then fundamental to all of this, of course, is a traffic monitor um, on top of all of this, just to monitor all traffic and a watchdog component. Um, so we, we have these uh, real time validation framework components that are continuously monitoring um, the output. Um, and we aim to have a human in the loop and watchdog alerts um, as part of all of this. Now, this, this is the broad design. We have a prototype already, but again, we're really looking to your help to, to enable us to refine this to something that is um, very solid and we can have confidence that um, we have a very safe ap um, application of generative AI. So with that said, that's to give you some a, a broad, a quick whistle stop tour of some of the directions that we're going where we really need your help. And now I'll hand over to Rachel for that last part. Which I'm so excited to get to engage you all and um, hear your thoughts and hear how you might think this tool is useful, what constraints you see around it. I'm really excited to be in conversation with all of you. So please feel free to share any thoughts you've had so far in the chat, any questions you have in the Q&A. Um, I will speak for less than 10 minutes and then we'll go straight into questions. So we only have three questions right now and we have plenty of time. Don't be shy. Um, ask any questions that you have or excited to hear what you're thinking um, and share where you're at. Um, so with that, I want to share what's happening next. As Matt shared, there's a lot in development, a lot of prototypes we're working on, um, but we need to dive more deeply into user research to understand your specific needs and pain points to find out what exactly would be useful. Tali earlier shared at a high level why uh, we're building this based on the feedback we've gotten from a variety of humanitarian actors, but we want to think very specifically through detailed interviews, surveys, and workshops no need to participate in all of these things, but maybe at least one um, to get your input on what uh, specifically we should be addressing in the scope of the project. Because as Matt mentioned, there's lots of guardrails that we need to put in place to ensure this is a safe solution. And one of them is being mindful that uh, we don't want a chat box that is meant to um, be too open to a, a wide parameter space. We don't want it to do all things for humanitarian data. Instead, we're going to focus on specific skills. Maybe it's pop population metrics, or maybe it's who is doing what humanitarian activity where. Um, and so we'll add more features over time, but we really need to focus on that small piece to make sure that we can um, answer those crucial questions and test the results and then move forward. And so that's what this research will inform, this scope identification. I know it might seem like we've already scoped the project, but there is um, more narrowing that we need to do in scoping, which brings us to prototype enhancement. Um, Data Kind and Save the Children have already developed, as Matt mentioned, and we've talked about a rapid prototype, which combines relief web and humanitarian data exchange data. Um, but we need to, to modify it based on the scope as shared. So we'll enrich the data set and the output based on your feedback, based on what you share in our user research and some of the data sources uh, that you think would be most useful. So we'll really need your support. And that, and then another step that is all about you is testing for success. We need to make sure our tool is usable um, so that all the models can be working as intended and it can be valuable in your day-to-day -day work. You can actually uh, find it to be useful. And really that will lead to collaborative refinement. The community needs to be designing alongside our team. Um, and this brings us to, to think about a basic tenant of this work of designing with the users instead of for the users. And um, so your active participation will be really vital as we're refining. And that brings us to wider testing. So what um, we call user acceptance testing will be rolled out to different user groups based on use case. And the purpose of this is to get targeted feedback for a continuous improvement. Uh, we'll have phased cohorts based on different 
users and different organizations. Um, and that will the, the exact scope of that will be designed alongside all of uh, this enhanced user research and more usability testing. <laughs> So I mentioned a lot of things that involve getting involved. So how do you get involved? Uh, there's four particular areas that we'd love to get you involved in. I'm already seeing some questions in the chat about uh, what will be involved in testing. Uh, can't wait to answer those during the Q&A, but please put any questions you have using the Q&A feature um, so we can make sure we're tracking responses to all of those. But the first piece is we need some help in the next phase of user research. As I already mentioned, we've got broad pain points and we want to co-design what data set, what question, um, what is going to be most useful uh, to get specific on our narrow use case for the chatbot to ensure that we have safety and accountability measures in place. So this really has to happen with our community and we're very excited um, to, to work with you on that. So specifically for the conversational agent that Matt shared about, this means finding out what types of questions you are asking that will provide valuable. If you already have an idea of a question that you think would you would ask a chatbot like this to get insight from data, um, we're going to share a survey in the chat right now that you can start to type in your answer about what type of questions um, you might want to use a tool like this for. And so this is really essential. So if you want to participate immediately in user research, as I'm talking, you can get started. And then we also need help on usability testing, which will happen alongside a prototype development. Um, as mentioned, we've developed that prototype with Humanitarian Data Exchange and Relief Web, but we'll need to refine it in usability sessions, especially across folks in different countries and different types of users who engage in a different way. We want to make sure it's accessible and uh, equitable and available to everyone. So please uh, be part of that. And then user acceptance testing, as mentioned earlier, this is going to be um, our cohort-based acceptance testing to really balance across user groups. Um, what this might involve is a 30 to 60 minute live virtual session where you log into maybe Zoom on your computer and you play with the tool, you get early access, you get to see what it's like, try to use it, and maybe myself or someone else at Datakind will be sitting there watching and, and identifying what's, you know, what, what is a poor design choice that is not clear and what can we improve to make it easier for you to use the tool. So user acceptance testing is really easy, fun, a great way to get engaged and learn about this tool as it's in progress and um, get some experience in using generative AI and get insights from data uh, very promptly. So hope you'll you'll join us for those sessions. And then finally, we want ongoing community support and feedback. We wanna build this tool alongside our community. Um, and it's all about uh, engaging constantly and continuous improvement so that we can have that, um, that usefulness and make sure that we're really encompassing all concerns and questions into the tool. So hopefully I've already convinced you to engage in one of these uh, um, four areas, but if I haven't yet, I want to just quickly share some of the benefits of participating. First, you'll get early access to tools to streamline and improve your work and explore new ways to rapidly access and be able to use humanitarian data. Whether or not you're a data professional, uh, getting insight from data can be extremely useful. So this is a way to maybe get that access and um, start to use data in more of your day-to-day -day decision making um, by piloting some of our tools. You also get to be part of co-creating this AI-powered product to address your specific needs. If you participate in user research, it will be most useful to you in your specific use case. So if you want it to benefit your work, please come join us. Um, we also want to support you in enhancing your practical skills in using generative AI. AI in your work context. So alongside enabling you to test the tools we're building, we're going to provide resources to help you learn and grow in your own generative AI skills so that um, that can be something you put on your resume and something that you grow for your organization. And uh, maybe you would become an advocate within your organization for others to use generative AI ethically, responsibly, and with accountability in place. 
you also get to be part of testing uh, for equity and accountability in developing ethical AI. I know for me, that's a big uh, value alignment moment to get to be a part of that and thinking about those things. So if that uh, resonates with you, that's a benefit as well. And then we're excited to have a community of practice that we're launching. So we'll have opportunities for folks to connect with one another uh, virtually, on online and, and um, asynchronously in like a Slack workspace or some other space where folks can share resources, uh, talk to one another, and um, meet other people who are working in the same space as you. And then finally, you'll get to be a contributor uh, to a solution that will enable humanitarian actors to overcome persistent and pervasive data pain points in order to prioritize action, coordinate more effectively, and make more timely data-driven solutions. So as part of uh, a contributor here, you'll, you'll be one of the people who've made this tool a success. So we'll offer a lot of different ways to engage, whatever uh, technically works for you, whatever your time capacity is, uh, we really want to find something that, that works for you to get your voice involved in so we can prioritize the most pressing problems and design a solution that reflects your experiences. So with that, you might be ready how to get involved. Um, please, the link is already in the chat. If you fill in that survey, you are, you're already doing the first step, which is more user research. That survey is one of our pieces of user research. It's just two questions about the kind of questions you might ask a tool like this. Very quick and easy um, alongside signing up for additional engagement as part of our community of practice. You can use this QR code if you have your phone, pull it up, scan the QR code if that's, if you're a techie person like that. But uh, if you just want the easiest possible way to get involved, I'm launching right now a quick poll. And all you have to do is, it should have just popped up on your screen, is type your email address um, into this question. We will not share this publicly. It will just be for DataKind internally. And um, that will get you on the list to be part of the community of practice so you can learn about uh, additional opportunities. You can sign up for testing. You can uh, answer surveys in the future or do an interview, participate in a focus group, connect with others in the field. So please um, throw your email address into the poll that just popped up on your screen if you're interested in that. We're looking for humanitarian aid workers, folks who are advisors or researchers in the field. Um, if you are a data professional or an admin professional, we really want to get both sides of the coin there, uh, whether you're a funder or an advocate or find yourself in some other role that we haven't listed here in the humanitarian sector. Please, um, please join us as part of our community of practice. And with that, I will leave uh, this poll open so you can continue to sign up if you'd like to join and we'll move into some questions and answer. So we'll start with um, uh, some technical questions, perhaps, for uh, Matt, if that sounds good. Um, Matt, how do you ensure gender-sensitive programming is in your work? Absolutely. So um, <clears throat> this is where I think we really, really would love feedback from the community about data analysis and, um, and data insights with the, with the gender-sensitive programming programming um, integrated within that. So we would love to hear um, um, use cases and questions and what kind of insights, because that absolutely should be part of any solution, of course. Matt, I can add to that. Please. Uh, it's important to know that I, um, this isn't a chatbot that is reaching out to the public internet and gathering information from there. Um, which we know is very biased uh, against women and in other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're looking many times at closed databases, like information that Save the Children may have or, or other humanitarian actors or and uh, information that's related to public infrastructure in a country we may be uh, responding to. So that information is, uh, this actually gets to another question also. Uh, that information is uh, where are schools and clinics related, uh, where are water sources, 
uh, what kind of connectivity can we expect or, or where are the electric uh, access to electricity? Uh, so so it's, it's not look it, it's not one of these models that you read about that is um can become biased because it's crawling the public internet and there was a there was another question on um how do we deal with children's data what what kind of guardrails do we put in place um that we're not accessing children's data for this again we're looking more at um uh, infrastructure, public infrastructure, and uh, information about our our own resources and our responses uh, or planned responses to humanitarian emergencies. Uh, so this isn't a system that will access children's data, and and uh, we're not looking at using generative AI at Save the Children to do anything like that. Thanks, uh, John and Matt, for that. Uh, there's there are a couple of questions since we're on the topic of of guardrails and safety. Uh, there's another question about um, how you know if we could provide more details on the guardrails to prevent the hallucination problem and other design decisions that we've been con taking into consideration to help make sure the responses that we get from conversational agents and data sources are actually um, accurate. So um, maybe I'll share that screen, go back to the safety slide map, uh, if you'd like to take mm -hmm. that question, and I'll, that might be helpful to have that up uh, on screen while we're doing that. I'll just put that up in a second in case you want to start answering. Right, here we go. Okay, wonderful. So... Um... One of the things we've, and I'm sure many other people on this call have already unearthed, is that there are there are many, many different ways to address some of the same requirements. Um, there are some fantastic um, open source packages, uh, as well as a, a, a wide range of vendor solutions um, around safety. So we've tried to remain independent of vendors as much as possible, but we do um, acknowledge that sometimes it is good to explore both an open source solution as well as a vendor solution. So in terms of guardrails, there's the guardrails AI package itself, which allows you to specify templates for LLM responses. That's an open source approach. Um, but on uh, the vendor side, take, for example, uh, um, um, uh, generative Gen AI Studio in Azure, which provides a very convenient filter module that you can activate, um, uh, Azure Content uh, Content Filtering, I believe it's called Content Safety. Um, and so, with a few clicks, you can actually um, um, put a, a um, an interface on any large language model that you're using within Azure um, AI that will monitor for um, some of the aspects that you see here. So it's just to illustrate, we haven't yet resolved on the exact technical stack because it's quite an interesting equation to solve for. There are certain advantages with, with certain directions over others, um, but that's something that we will be very transparent about through this whole process. Um, we actually already, we have a technical stack analysis document in progress, but um, at some point we aim to publish that so that we can share with the community um, how we are progressing with that analysis and why there's certain decisions have been made and those decisions must absolutely be informed by um, people like you on this call. Thank you. Um, just trying to see if there are any other safety related questions. I think that's it there. There is uh, another question that we have here about, are we planning to incorporate, um, I guess it's reinforcement learning from human feedback in our model development. Um, so we have a question around having a set of users utilize a tool and evaluate the results from their perspective, uh, which could be an effective and fast mechanism for testing the quality uh, of what we're developing. and. I am hoping that um, what, what Rachel has presented about how we aim to work very closely with users in 
really deep diving into specific, you know, scenarios in and use cases and questions uh, that we hope, you know, people want to have, uh, you know, answered in a more efficient and fast and effective way. Let's let's identify those questions. We really want to participate. We want to work very closely with all the variety of different types of users that Rachel also shared um, to do usability testing and then going into user acceptance testing as well. I think we have a whole uh, plan of all the different ways in which we want to work closely uh, with users to actually evaluate how we're doing, what we're developing, and is it really serving uh, and addressing the needs uh, that that are of the, of the humanitarian community and helping us get to the impact that we aim to get to. Um, anything more to add there, Rachel? I think Matt has something to add. <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, Matt, go ahead. <laughs> Apologies. Um, that's a really, really, really great question because, um, well, one, one aspect of it is we, we, even in the prototypes already, we've offered um, a flow where the user at any point in that interaction can provide feedback about the the assistant itself. Um, so just to say, well, that response was terrible, or that response was great. And so we will very much use that to refine, just as with any application development, that feedback is, is critical. But as Tali mentioned, there's the other aspect, and that is um, uh, perf performing live analysis semi-live it's not it's, it's not in the second but as we gather more data as more people use a conversational interface it's very important to look as tony mentioned at the common types of questions that are being asked because i think there's another question a really great question about um, how does this differ from lidar and i think this my answer here is it speaks to that somewhat um Having an assistant be really useful and really efficient and something that people want to go back to day on day for their day to day tasks is um, there is a lot of engineering involved around the specific use case. So generic solutions may well form a fantastic backbone of 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 some of the low level technical processing that's required, but um, Retrieving humanitarian data is obviously um, has has a lens of humanitarian data. What's the best way to present that data? You could just take a brute force approach and just get all the data in a big blob and 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 pass through it. But actually, as you start getting more information on the questions that humanitarians are asking, we can do things like engineer some pre-processing. If people are always asking who's doing what where um, in a particular location, or even just asking that question we can pre-process the answers to those questions ahead of time. And it's those kind of engineering preemptive um, uh, tuning, if you like, that will be key to the user experience of using something like this and the efficacy of how useful it actually is. So, um, so yes, reinforcement learning of a sort in that um, we will be looking at feedback and using that to tailor the engineering of the solution very much. Now, the second part is automatic um, learning of the, the platform. And that is something that is a, it's a very vibrant field, um, especially agents, multiple agents, but we, um, we're probably going to opt for the more conservative um, parts of the solution at this time. But again, the aim will be in getting user feedback and working with users to get something that's really useful and fun to use and actually very useful. And I, I would add that what we're looking for is recommendations from the system. So it's not that we would blindly take the output and implement in the country. Um, we work with some of the, the um, most experienced humanitarian professionals in the world, both at SAVE and, and our partners responding to emergencies. And um, so there's a lot of sense checking that individuals have to do that that are the humans in the loop uh, in order to make those decisions. And um, of course, the, the field is always changing and uh, capabilities of organizations are always changing. So the training data could be based on information that, that isn't fully up to date. So, so we may know things that the training data that 
isn't available in the training data, uh, which is one of the reasons why humans with experience in the area need to be able to uh, review those recommendations and make actions based on both those recommendations and and their experience and and uh, uh, for instance uh, agreements with the government and with other organizations. And there is a secondary output which I think is perhaps worth mentioning is if people are asking questions um, related to humanitarian data sets. And we see there's a pattern or a group of questions where that data doesn't exist on one of the platforms. That's an interesting um, observation in and of itself, I, I would imagine, because we get information from the community about where um, providers of that data or platforms could potentially progress and make some um, movement towards making sure that data is on those platforms. So, so the, the, the assistant itself could gather some um, interesting use cases. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, so we've answered most of the questions in the Q&A already, but if you, um, your response to that is, you didn't answer my question, um, you can pop into the Q&A bubble in Zoom and find the answers to some that were typed instead of uh, spoken out loud. And so uh, feel free to review the questions that were uh, that we've covered out loud and those that we've typed answers to. If you have additional comments or if you want us to give a voiceover to anything that um, that we typed an answer to, but you'd love to hear more out loud, please feel free to submit another question or uh, type as a comment in that question and we'll get, um, we'll, we have time to share more details on any of these questions. So please feel free to continue to add questions in the Q&A. But in the meantime, I'll pop over to try to answer uh, some questions in the chat. Although worth noting, it's easy to miss questions in the chat. So we would love if you could put them in the Q&A so we can make sure we're tracking everything that comes in. Um, one question is around who will be involved with the usability testing? Will it be remote or in person or both? And then as a follow-up, will the testing be done in different languages for those who live outside of English speaking countries? Tali, if you could pull up the slide um, with the QR code and our list of practitioners, that would be great. So for usability testing, we'd love to involve a variety of potential users. Um, the list on the slide of humanitarian aid workers, of course, advisors, researchers, data and admin professionals, funders and advocates are our primary groups that we've thought of so far, but we're probably missing someone. So if we are missing someone, please uh, sign up, click click on the link here, use this QR code to enter into the survey. You can let us know what user group we're missing. You can also uh, reach out to us via email. You can just directly email me at rachel at datakind.org. I'll share that at the end and let us know if we're missing a user group that uh, we should be including in usability testing. We're also going to be making sure that our testing uh, spans a diverse group of different types of users and uh, things like checking for things like gender, checking for representation across different regions globally, and checking for um, for equity in a variety of ways. And if you fill the survey, you'll notice that there is a, a quick second page that has some really fast questions that we'll be using to check in on if we really have an equitable and representative uh, group of folks participating so we can identify, for example, hey, we don't have as many uh, people identifying as women as we would like uh, participating in. So we can specifically target outreach to increase our inclusion and uh, representation in our community. So we're really grateful if you're willing, those questions are optional, so you can skip them if you're not comfortable, but if you're willing to share um, that would be helpful to us in ensuring we have representation. Regarding um, location, we will be doing all of this remotely to hopefully be able to include more people uh, because we can't physically be everywhere. And then regarding languages, um, would love to hear from you on if you have a different a language that's a priority. Um, we don't currently have plans for that, but we will love to explore more and learn um, what your needs are and how we can best support across different languages and get that in the um, 
in the queue for maybe a longer term uh, plan, but we'll, we'll just about other that. languages, Rachel. I'm so sorry yeah. to interrupt, but um, that is one of the um, functional areas that we are exploring. We aim for the, the any solution to be multilingual. Um, as some of you may be aware, the larger LLMs have poor support for, you know, for many languages around the world. So for example, we we have previous partners that we've worked with, uh, Jacaranda Health have developed a Swahili um, LLM, for example, and we are um, aiming to bring to bear some of those um, initiatives and also to analyze the multilingual capability. But that's really where we need help from people who can um, provide feedback to us about how well we're doing in, in other languages. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Sally or John, do you have anything else to add to those? I don't right now. Uh, just that uh, we are really actively looking for people. So please reach out. Um, please uh, click the link here if you haven't already and let us know your email address so we can include you in the future. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, you know, we really know how busy this community is um there's a lot going on around the world and a lot of people who are actively engaged um right now in coordination and humanitarian response uh it's just you want to be involved don't have that much time um i know that a lot of folks are actually uh helping to protect constant inundation of requests and questions uh, for those who are actually like working to um, serve people uh, in crises. So with we really recognize that it's also very challenging for a lot of, particularly the, those aid workers who, are, who, you know, to participate. So if you have any ideas in, you know, how you think we can engage people who are closest maybe to the work uh, and closest to requiring, you know, data quickly in order to do their work, um, but could not, if, if you feel none of these avenues are adequate, we'd love to hear as well if you have any feedback for how we can better work uh, with them. We could also think about um, engaging folks who have, who have recently returned or, you know, and we're happy to spend a bit more time to talk through about what we're developing here. We will be sending out this recording of this webinar, the, the presentation here as well. Uh, so hopefully that is already uh, a resource that folks can use. But uh, yes, we are very open to other suggestions to be more inclusive. Yes, please share all your ideas. Um, and thank you to those who've already shared in the chat that policymakers and those from the regulatory side are not on our list. This has already been extremely helpful. So thank you. We'll make sure to add those. Um, Matt, I see a question that's probably for you. Would love to um, share what technical infrastructure or resources are needed to implement the generative AI solutions that were suggested. Great question. So um, again, we are exploring, I think right now we have about four prototypes using different technical stacks, but one of the requirements across all of them is we aim for something that can be run in-house by any organization. Now we're it, um, in house for any organization. We're exploring. Um, we are many of those prototypes are using cloud based LLMs from providers like Op, um, Azure OpenAI, um, but we're also exploring the ability, um, the possibility of um, running LLMs locally. So the aim is to have something that people um, can um, run locally, essentially. Wonderful. Um, and one more that I think is for you, Matt, um, what's the stage of development on the application? What are the current technical challenges that need additional resourcing and support? Great question. Um, so we have about three or four prototypes deployed, but these are very, very formative. The, the screenshot I showed earlier is actually from a prototype. Um, uh, uh, so we are right now just using that as a test bed for making sure that we have all of the DevOps and testing infrastructure and monitoring in place, so some of the technical stuff. Um, uh, and so that's where we're at with that. And in terms of some of the challenges, I think one of the main challenges is that 
the landscape is moving incredibly quickly. And so uh, one of the challenges is to resolve on um, a technical stack that um, is has longevity, that is going to be really useful to people for a long period of time. Um, some aspects such as take, for example, searching documents is something called retrieve, retrieval augmented generation, RAG. But as we've just seen, some vendors now are incorporating that into their solutions. And so does it make sense to invest heavily in something like that that is going to be sold for by a vendor product? I don't think so. I think, I think that's one of the challenges. And our focus, therefore, has been to really um, target or, 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 or add value in the humanitarian context. So be um, the technology to be cognizant of those humanitarian data sources that to be uh, tuned and engineered to best help humanitarians for the questions and type of question types that are asked. So that, that kind of speaks to some of the challenges. It's a rapidly moving landscape. And then of course, um, uh, safety and cost are, are also two challenges that we are hoping to, well, safety we've spoken about, but cost optimization is again, an important aspect to this. Um, we have to make sure that um, what we're trying to achieve there's a trade-off with cost and um, performance, and so we're, we're we're hoping to we will publish our research on on that as as and when the time becomes available. Great, and the best way to stay up to date on all of this and provide your insight and help us address these challenges and these next steps is to join our community of practice. Um, if we haven't said that enough. Um, so I think we've answered all the questions. Tali, do you want to pull up our closing slides? Um, we hope that you'll join us. We hope to be in touch with you. I've also just shared my direct email in the chat. So if you have any feedback or ideas for how we can improve our community engagement, I'd love to hear from you directly. Uh, please don't be shy. We really care about equity, inclusion, and accessibility. So um, any thoughts you have are essential. And I'll also share one last link in the chat of, for how you can subscribe to our monthly newsletter. Um, maybe you're not a humanitarian actor and you came to this webinar to learn more about generative AI and the social sector at large. We have lots of other things going on at Datakind that might be relevant or useful to you. Um, so maybe the community of practice isn't the right fit. Uh, we still want you to be part of our broader Datakind community. So thanks for joining us today. And the best way to stay uh, involved broadly in Datakind is just to subscribe to our newsletter with the link in the chat. Thanks again for joining us. Um, we are grateful to have you all as part of our community and grateful that you took time out of your day uh, to co-design these solutions with us going forward. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Thank you.